In 1992, Sprint wanted to build a cell phone tower in the small scenic town of Monument, Colorado. But the public was concerned that the tower would obscure their mountain views. So Sprint hired Larson Camouflage, a company known for creating artificial natural environments for Disney parks, zoos, and museum exhibits. Their solution was the monopine. Larson Camouflage has gone on to conceal thousands of cell towers since, using the mono palm, mono elm, cypresses, and cactuses. Across the United States, cell towers have been concealed in flagpoles, street lamps, water towers, art installations, and even church steeples. But these disguises aren't really fooling anyone, are they? They're also pretty expensive, adding up to $100,000 extra to the cost of building a cell tower. We see so many of these fake cell tower trees thanks in part to efforts to combat visual pollution. Things like billboards, crowded highway signage, antennas, and wires. But is visual pollution really pollution or just a fancy name for an eyesore? In 2009, Notre Dame law professor John Copeland Nagel learned of a potential new cell phone tower proposed for his town. Nagel went on to write a paper about whether pollution is the right framework for thinking about cell phone towers. Former U.S. First Lady Lady Bird Johnson was a strong proponent for the beautification of America. She believed that billboards, ugly buildings, signs, and telephone poles negatively affected people's mental health and contributed to higher crime rates. So, her husband got to work. You know I love that woman, and she wants that Highway Beautification Act, and by God, we're gonna get it for her, President Johnson said. The bill, the Highway Beautification Act, was passed. It prohibited certain types of advertising along federally funded highways and interstates. And ever since then, committees, courts, and academics have rallied around the term visual pollution to declare their opposition to man-made additions to the landscape. As Nagel points out, cell towers are a new version of an old problem. In the early 1900s, people made aesthetic complaints about electric wires, telephone wires, and trolley cables as communities modernized. When neighbors took those complaints to court, courts often favored the power company or the phone company. As utilities, they had a legal right of way called eminent domain. The big question in all these cases was, is the aesthetic harm caused by a telephone pole something that deserves compensation? Once underground wires became available, cities and courts started requiring utilities to use those less objectionable looking underground wires instead of the above ground ones strung up on poles. With the rise of mobile phones in the 1980s came the rise of cell towers and resident complaints. Cell providers don't have eminent domain, so they have to persuade and sometimes pay private landowners to allow a tower on their property. The property owner gets paid, but the neighbors still have to deal with the visual pollution. In turn, they end up lodging complaints with local governments. Local governments got really adept at using zoning and other types of regulations to block cell phone towers from being built. That might have solved local aesthetic problems, but it created a new national problem. Too many restrictive local requirements would hinder the development of a national wireless communications network. So Congress stepped in with a compromise, the Telecommunications Act of 1996. The TCA made it more difficult for local governments to block cell towers based on aesthetic concerns alone. The TCA requires the local government to provide substantial evidence that the cell phone tower would cause aesthetic harm to the community. Remember our friend Professor Nagel? In his paper, he asks, how does a local government show that there is substantial evidence that a proposed cell tower will result in an aesthetic harm? Well, he says, you could compile a stack of resident complaints that the cell tower is ruining their view, but those are, in the words of one court, no more than individualized aesthetic opinions not based on any fixed standards. To really build your case, perhaps you could present some of the studies linking urban environments to psychological distress. There is evidence that our physical environment affects our mental health. It's also been shown that communing with nature is good for our mental health. But there is no conclusive study that specifically links the appearance of cell phone towers with negative mental health outcomes. So that might be a bit of a stretch, and Nagel's question still stands. How does one prove, objectively, that the tower is causing real aesthetic harm?
The answer might lie in the way we handle other types of pollution. As Nagel points out, no environment is entirely free from pollution. Government agencies decide how much pollution is acceptable in the air, in our food, in the water. Cell towers provide a service that we all rely on and enjoy using. Nagel suggests that this arguably outweighs the minor aesthetic harm cell towers might cause. Nagel also points out that as we become used to things, they stand out less. Perhaps the longer cell phone towers are around, the less we'll notice them. Barbed wire, electric wires, and telephone poles all used to generate aesthetic complaints, and then we kind of got used to them. Or, in the case of phone lines, when a better solution came along, underground wiring, towns started requiring utilities to opt for in-ground wires. So new technology could make towers obsolete, and the whole argument might become a moot point. This is all a moot point. <laughs> Well, the argument about cell phone towers will become moot, but the next visual pollution claims are already on the horizon. Wind farm proposals are now generating all kinds of complaints that they're ruining views. Here we go again. Hit the comments to let us know what you think. What is the value on an unspoiled view? Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.